Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us. In honor of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we are pleased to host this webinar on novel advances in breast cancer treatment. Before we get started, a few technical items. If your connection is lost, please simply log in again using your registration link. During the next hour, we will hear from four experts about exciting new research and treatments for various stages of breast cancer. Following their presentation, all of the panelists will join for a roundtable discussion and then a live moderated Q&A session. Please submit your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. At the conclusion of today's webinar, you will receive a link to the event recording as well. And now I would like to introduce the panelists. You will hear first hear from Dr. Natasha Shebani, a newly appointed assistant professor of biomedical engineering and radiology and medical imaging at the University of Virginia, who just received the prestigious NIH Director's Early Independence Award. Her research centers on the use of FUS, focused ultrasound, for potentiation of cancer immunotherapy. She will start the program with an overview of focused ultrasound, including a sneak peek into the preclinical research that has led to innovative first in human clinical trials. Next, we will hear from Dr. David Brennan, a professor in the Department of Surgical Oncology at the University of Virginia and chief of the Division of Breast and Melanoma Surgery. He will discuss how Natasha's research has led to clinical trials and how he is using several focused ultrasound mechanisms of action to treat patients with various stages of breast cancer. We are also fortunate to have Dr. Yang Meng on the panel. She recently completed her PhD and is now completing her neurosurgery residence at the University of Toronto. She will discuss how focused ultrasound and targeted drug delivery with blood brain barrier opening is being used in clinical trials to treat women with HER2 positive breast cancer metastases to the brain and discuss the recent peer review publication. Dr. Gregory Charnada will then finish this portion of the program. He is an associate professor in the Department of Radiation Oncology and Medical Biophysics at the University of Toronto and senior scientist at the Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center in Toronto, a leading institution in focused ultrasound research. With a special interest in breast cancer, he will provide us with an overview of advances in radiation therapy and new clinical trials that investigate the potential advantages of combining focused ultrasound and radiation therapy. And now on to our presentations. Hello everyone, my name is Natasha Shabani, and I'm an assistant professor of biomedical engineering at the University of Virginia. Today I'm going to be providing a preclinical overview in the hopes of setting us up for a fruitful discussion about novel advances in breast cancer treatment. So much of the work that will be discussed today is prefaced on the promise of cancer immunotherapy. And the general notion of how immunotherapy and targeted therapies differ is shown here on the slide. You can see that relative to targeted therapies for which there tend to be more survivors at the beginning of treatment, patients who receive benefit from immunotherapy such as checkpoint blockade can often see more durable and sometimes even complete responses. Now, the problem is that not all patients respond. And in fact, only about 15 to 40% of patients who receive checkpoint inhibitors respond favorably depending on their cancer type. Recent studies have linked this to a number of different prognostic factors, chief among which is tumor immune infiltrate. And as shown here in the figure on the right, you can see that patients with pre-existing signatures of immunity and more specifically of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes tend to respond favorably to checkpoint inhibition, whereas immunologically ignorant tumors uh, don't. And so it's thought that tumors in this non-responder category may be ushered towards a more favorable uh, immunophenotype via combination therapy. And one of those pillars of combination therapy that we're going to explore today is focused ultrasound. Now, we have many different hypotheses for how focused ultrasound can potentiate immunotherapy, and these are really underscored by various intersections between FUS and the cancer immun immunity cycle. So the hypothesized intersections that we have for this are uh, illustrated here on the slide by these red arrows. Just briefly, I'll mention that, um, you know, of course, we know that FUS can mediate both thermal and mechanical effects, and these can obviously have varied impacts on the immune system. We can hypothesize the increased release and altered profile of molecules such as antigens, 
damage associated molecular patterns, um, cytokines, even adhesion molecules on endothelial cells. And of course, we know that focused ultrasound can lift physical barriers in tumors as well. And so as denoted by this final arrow, we can potentially increase the permeability of tumors to immune cells, as well as give the right cues to enable T cell uh, activation and, and proliferation. So I'm not going to be discussing each of these hypotheses in detail today for the sake of time, but I simply provide them here to give it, the audience a sense for the broad landscape of research that's currently being performed across a slew of different solid tumor types, including breast cancer. And these are all with the end goal in mind of being able to extend the durable benefits of immunotherapy to a broader spectrum of patients. So briefly, I'm going to share a vignette uh, of some preclinical work that we've done really to be able to sensitize breast tumors to the impacts of immunotherapy. And so we've performed this work in the setting of a murine metastatic memory carcinoma model called 4T1. Our goal here was to evaluate FUS partial thermal ablation in this model using this custom built ultrasound guided focused ultrasound system that's shown here. Um, we overlay a grid of sonications onto the ultrasound visible tumor as you see here and then perform two planes of sonication in order to achieve our partial thermal ablation effect. And what we came to find was really that not only did focused ultrasound partial thermal ablation not constrain tumor outgrowth in this model, but the effects really weren't underscored by any meaningful changes in the T cell compartment, either in the tumors or in draining lymph nodes. And so we were interested to understand what barriers might exist to achieving this effect. And we came to find that these tumors are highly burdened with myeloid-derived suppressor cells. Now, there's a chemotherapy known as gemcitabine that is typically used as a salvage chemo in the context of breast cancer, and we layered on three doses of gemcitabine uh, onto our paradigm here, basically to leverage its ability to transiently inhibit myeloid-derived suppressor cells. And so we initiated gemcitabine concomitant with FUS and then ad administered two additional doses set one week apart. And you can see here that gem monotherapy actually does constrain these 4T1 tumors. And again, this is by virtue of its myeloreductive capacity, but it was in the setting of combination therapy that we saw the strongest impact on uh, constraining tumor outgrowth. Now we've been able to recapitulate this effect with another system known as the Theraqueon Echo Pulse. Here is an image of the visualization and treatment unit that's associated with this device, which also happens um, to be under clinical investigation here at UVA for multiple different clinical trials that are evaluating focused ultrasound ablation in combination with immunotherapy, both in breast cancer as well as other solid tumors. We've also observed that um, FUS and GEM can extends overall survival in 4T1 tumor bearing mice. So here looking at the survival curve, hopefully you can appreciate that our combination outperforms both the monotherapy and sham groups. And interestingly, survival of mice uh, in this study was really based on humane endpoints that related to the onset of pulmonary metastatic burden, as opposed to primary tumor volume. So we conceived it uh, possible that either the rate of metastatic seeding was limited by this impact of combinatorial therapy on 4T1 tumors, or that perhaps there's some sort of increased systemic immunity that's limiting the growth of metastatic lesions. And so this compelled us to explore that latter hypothesis by moving into a loss of function study uh, to answer the question of whether our protection is dependent on the adaptive immune compartment. And so you can see here again, the stratification between our, our uh, growth curves and wild type mice. And what we did here was essentially evaluate our combinatorial therapy in RAG1 knockout mice which lack mature T and B cells. And you can see here that we completely lose our protective effect when the adaptive immune system is uh, removed. Now, this is just uh, a figure that's summarizing all of our growth curves in the context of gem monotherapy, as well as combination therapy, where we're basically able to confirm a loss of FUS plus gem mediated protection in the absence of an intact adaptive immune compartment. And this suggested to us that T and or B cells might be playing a critical role in this paradigm. And of course, to further tease out the role of T cells specifically, we next turn to a different loss of function study where we depleted CD8 and CD4 T cells in mice on a FUS plus gem background. And you can see here again that we lose both our growth constriction as well as our survival benefit 
following depletions uh, of T cells. And this confirmed that indeed CD8 and CD4 T cells are key mediators of the protection effect that's offered by FUS plus GEM. Um, these are just some snapshots from a paper that we recently published in the Journal for Immunotherapy of Cancer. But before I move on, I just wanna mention that our work has actually recently been translated into a clinical trial at UVA that will be evaluating focused ultrasound ablation in combination with gemcitabine in breast cancer patients. And we're of course very excited about this and Dr. Brennan will today be sharing more information about this trial. Now I'd like to spend the last few slides providing an overview of some work in brain metastasis of breast cancer. And to begin with the challenge to treating brain metastases, I have to talk about two different physical barriers that pose major challenges to the meaningful delivery of systemically administered therapies, both to primary as well as secondary brain tumors, which is what we're focusing on today. And these barriers are the blood brain and blood tumor barriers or BBB and BTB respectively. Um, the BBB refers to a dense vascular network that's lined with intact tight junctions, and this barrier is highly restrictive of both convective and diffusive transport within the brain. Meanwhile, the BTB is comprised of a heterogeneously leaky microvasculature, which gives way to what we call the enhanced permeability and retention, or EPR effect, for passive drug transport. Now, in this region, there are also high interstitial fluid pressures, which can hinder convective transport and penetrance of circulating therapies, such as antibodies, in the case of immunotherapy, uh, into tissues. And it's now well established that FUS-mediated BBB and BTB disruption can circumvent these barriers, both safely and repeatedly, in order to achieve meaningful delivery of drugs, genes, immunotherapies, et cetera, into CNS pathologies. And so just to briefly touch on what this mechanism is comprised of, I'm here showing a cross section of a capillary that's lined with endothelial cells and tightly sealed off from the neighboring brain parenchyma via tight junctions. When we systemically administer our therapeutic along with what we call microbubbles, uh, which are basically gas-filled particles, typically on the order of about two to three microns, and their shell can be comprised of different proteins, lipids, or other synthetic materials. These bubbles will essentially act as acoustic amplifiers in the presence of an acoustic field that's generated typically by an extracorporeal transducer. Uh, the oscillation or otherwise known as cavitation of these bubbles results in transient disruption of the tight junctions lining the endothelium, as well as other mechanisms of sonoporation and transcytosis. And taken together, these mechanisms can enable delivery of a systemically circulating therapeutic, or in our case, an immunotherapy uh, into the brain parenchyma. So this mechanism has been leveraged uh, in, in many different respects across the literature, and I just like to highlight a few examples of where it's being used in brain metastasis of breast cancer. Here I'm showing work from the groups of Nathan McDonald and Calervo Hinnanen that has shown that FUS can potentiate the delivery of Herceptin, or otherwise known as Trastuzumab, which is a HER2 targeted antibody uh, across the BBB and BTB of HER2 amplified breast cancer brain metastases. So the figure on the left shows that deposition of Herceptin is actually acoustic pressure dependent. And meanwhile, the figures on the right show how the combination of FUS and Her Herceptin can actually constrain tumor outgrowth, and interestingly have a stratification between responders and non-responders, as I alluded to in my early slides. And um, this combination can also offer survival benefit in tumor-bearing rodents as well. Moving to a similar vein, this slide shows some work from Calervo Hinnanen and colleagues where HER2 specific natural killer cells were not only shown to be able to cross the BBB and BTB with focused ultrasound, but they also offered tumor control uh, as well as survival benefit in uh, HER2 amplified breast cancer brain metastases. And this work in collection has recently culminated in a first in human clinical trial at Sunnybrook Research Institute, wherein trastuzumab was successfully delivered in a safe and repeatable manner in HER2 positive brain metastases. And Dr. Mang is today going to discuss the results of that trial with us. 
So I'd like to conclude here and thank um, all of our focused ultrasound immuno-oncology collaborators at UVA uh, for um, their role in, in the uh, preclinical work that I showed, as well as the Focused Ultrasound Foundation for their support and the invitation to join today's webinar. Thank you as well to Theraclion for their support and role in our preclinical and clinical FUS immunotherapy trials at UVA. And finally, thank you to our past and present funding sources that are enabling the continuation of this work. Looking forward to our continued discussion. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. David Brennan, and I am going to be talking about the Focused Ultrasound Ablation Program at the University of Virginia for tumors of the breast. I'm going to quickly review our program at UVA to date and wrap it up with discussion of our newest study, Breast 54, which is focused ultrasound ablation in combination with low-dose gemcitabine to augment the immune control of patients with early stage breast cancer. And we're really excited about this study because it's our first study involving patients with early stage breast cancer. So we began our breast-focused ultrasound ablation program at UVA by treating a benign tumor of the breast called a fibroadenoma. To date, we've treated just short of 50 of these lesions on protocol. Here is the creation of a treatment plan from that initial study treating the fibroadenoma. You can see the fibroadenoma uh, right here on the treatment plan and targeting, and here's the treatment plan being created. This is a lesion before treatment, delivery of the sonication pulse, and the resulting hyperechoic mark of the sonication zone. So this is typically what we saw. These are images from our first patient. On the left, uh, you have the pre-treatment ultrasound image with the volume for the fibroadenoma being 1.53 cubic centimeters. Three months later, after treatment, the volume was down to 0.47 cubic centimeters. That's a 69% reduction in volume. After demonstrating we could safely and effectively treat benign tumors of the breast, we moved on to treating patients with breast cancer. Our first breast cancer trial was B48, which was the combination of focused ultrasound ablation and pembrolizumab to treat patients with stage four breast cancer. The goal of this trial was to initiate a local and circulating immune response to the tumor. And our preliminary findings demonstrated that we were successful at doing so. We were able to alter the tumor microenvironment locally with an increase in trafficking of anti-tumor T lymphocytes inducing a localized immune response. However, much to our dismay, shortly after that, myeloid-derived suppressor cells or MDSCs would often traffic into that tumor and tamp down the local immune response. This wasn't a tremendous surprise because as you heard earlier, this has also been seen in animal models. So after demonstrating that focused ultrasound ablation could initiate a localized immune response in patients with stage four breast cancer, we began developing a trial to treat patients with earlier stage breast cancer. That trial is breast 54 and Patrick Dillon is the PI on this study. In this study, we use focused ultrasound ablation in combination with low dose gemcitabine to augment the immune control of early stage breast cancer. So why combine gemcitabine with focused ultrasound ablation to treat patients with early stage breast cancer? Well, as you heard from Natasha in preclinical findings using mouse models, gemcitabine was able to decrease the number of circulating myeloid-derived suppressor cells. As you recall from my previous slide, those myeloid-derived suppressor cells tamp down the immune response. And if we can decrease the number of those cells, we hope to be able to induce an immune response with the focused ultrasound ablation in the tumor and allow it to persist more robustly and for a longer period of time by decreasing the ability of those myeloid-derived suppressor cells to tamp down the response. The study Breast54 will have three arms. In arm A, patients will receive gemcitabine alone. In arm B, they will undergo focused ultrasound alone. And in arm C, they will receive a combination of gemcitabine and focused ultrasound with the gemcitabine being given first. After those treatments, all the patients will have the standard of care therapy, which will include sentinel lymph node biopsy, definitive surgery, and will collect tissue from the tumor at various stages. After their surgical treatment, they'll receive standard adjuvant therapy and be followed for five years and will collect data over the entire time period. So for clarity, in breast 54, there'll be three arms. 
In arm A, patients will receive gemcitabine alone. In arm B, patients will undergo focused ultrasound ablation alone. And in arm C, they'll receive a combination of the two. Patients will be randomized one to one to one with a total of 48 subjects, and that means 16 patients in each arm. As BREAST54 is an exploratory study, we'll be looking at the primary endpoints of safety of focused ultrasound ablation, safety of gemcitabine alone, as well as the combination of the two. And we'll be looking at the following primary endpoints, adverse events, time to surgery, and positive margin rate. There are multiple secondary objectives and endpoints, but they are too numerous to review due to the time constraints of this presentation. However, they are presented on this slide as well as the next. In order to be included in this study, patients have to have early stage breast cancer, in other words, clinical stage one to three tumors. Tumors can be of any receptor status, and the lesion has to be accessible and visible to ultrasound-guided focused ultrasound ablation. For safety, the tumor should be greater than five millimeters from the skin, and the rib to treatment target zone distance should be greater than one centimeter. We will be using the Echopulse device for this study, which is manufactured by Theraclion. It's the same device that we've used to treat fibroadenomas in the breast, and to treat the tumors in the patients with stage four breast cancer in B48. We hope to soon receive an updated device with greatly improved imaging, which should allow us to more easily treat these smaller tumors in patients with earlier stage breast cancer. We're very much looking forward to getting Breast54 off the ground and treating our first patient. I'd like to wrap it up by thanking the following individuals. First and foremost, Patrick Dillon. He is the PI on Breast54. Uh, he's a medical oncologist at the University of Virginia and my tireless collaborator. I also want to thank Natasha and the Price Lab for their invaluable preclinical work. Natasha presented some of that before, and it's really their work that has informed the decisions on how to design this trial. I want to thank the Focused Ultrasound Foundation for their continued support, as well as Theraclion and the University of Virginia Cancer Center. Thank you for your attention. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ying. Uh, I work at Sunnybrook Hospital with Dr. Lipsman uh, in Toronto, Canada. And uh, welcome to the Fireside Chat uh, organized by the Focused Ultrasound Foundation. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share my work uh, in disrupting the blubbering barrier in patients with breast cancer and brain mets. So the blood brain barrier and blood tumor barrier restricts large molecules from reaching the target tissue in the brain. Um, and focused ultrasound can induce the uh, temporary opening of these barriers by um, oscillating the micro bubbles that are injected at the same time. And the, these micro bubbles oscillate very quickly at high frequencies to mechanically disrupt the junctions between the endothelial cells. This can be performed in a non-invasive fashion without any cutting of the skin. And it can be performed also in a spatially and temporally precise manner, which I will show you in a further slide. So many animal studies um, have shown that this technique is safe and feasible and very effective at delivering um, therapies of various sizes uh, in um, animals. However, uh, the, the data in human subjects is very early. Um, several clinical trials, early phase clinical trials, have been published in the recent years to show that this technique is safe uh, and well tolerated um, in patients with um, Alzheimer's disease, glioblastoma, um, but uh, so far uh, patients with breast cancer uh, have yet to been an unexplored indication for uh, this technology. So the goal of our study was to first uh, look at um, the feasibility and the safety of delivering focused ultrasound for blood-brain barrier opening in patients with breast cancer. Um, and two is to show whether we are actually effectively delivering the drug trastuzumab to the area where we ultrasound. Uh, how do we do this in patients? Uh, because it's hard to obtain tissue uh, where we can measure the dr actual drug concentration. Uh, we can do this by radio labeling the drug. This means that we take the trastuzumab and we tag it with a tracer that can light up on uh, imaging. 
and we use spec imaging to visualize the radioactive tracer. Uh, we do the study before ultrasound and we do it with ultrasound to see what kind of effect uh, the treatment has on the tissue uh, drug concentration uh, where we were targeting. Uh, so I'll walk you through one of the treatments. Um, on the top panel you see a picture of a patient's uh, brain tumor. Um, there is some leakiness to the barrier already um, with the tumor so you can see some contrast enhancement uh, that indicates a tumor itself. We then deliver ultrasound, which is indicated by the color map, um, shows the dose of ultrasound we delivered. And then you see an increase in enhancement compared to before treatment um, that indicates the barrier is, um, is more leaky than previously. And if we wait some time, we see that the barrier um, does close um, and the enhancement has come down to what it looked like uh, before treatment. So if we did uh, this um, spec study where we radio label uh, the drug with the trace that can be detected through spec imaging, uh, we inject the patient both before treatment and after treatment um, and we see that there is an increase in the level of uptake around the tumor target region uh, that indicates more of the drug is getting through with focused ultrasound than without. We do this imaging both uh, around four hours after initial injection as well as 48 hours. Um, this is fairly standard in terms of a spec imaging protocol. Um, it just shows that over time there's increased retention um, of the radioactive tracer in the area where uh, there had been increased blood-brain barrier permeability. This slide further illustrates the changes in spec signal um, or the changes in the tissue concentration of trastuzumab as a result of ultrasound in four patients. Uh, so just to walk you through each of these patients, patient one, two, three, four, and each of them, we see an increase in the signal uh, where, where the arrow is pointing uh, with, b from before to after treatment. And how is the spatial specificity of focused ultrasound in delivering trastuzumab? If we compare where we uh, deliver the ultrasound dose, which is a few, uh, delineated by the color map in the middle panel, we see it corresponds very well to actually where we see the increase in, uh, in the trastuzumab uh, levels by spec imaging. Uh, this is really important uh, because for drugs that are not as uh, safe uh, and more toxic than trastuzumab, uh, we will want to limit uh, the off-target effect and really um, uh, specifically deliver it to uh, the target tissue of, of interest. In this study, we'll be also documented the changing tumor volume over time, and we show some pr promising preliminary results uh, in these four patients that seem to be a, a reduction or stability of the tumor volumes over the course of follow-up. Um, however, this is very preliminary data and we hope to further investigate and collect more data through future studies. The future looks very bright in this field. It's a particularly exciting time as many trials are underway across the world in investigating focused ultrasound for, uh, for oncology. And we're eagerly awaiting the results of these trials. Um, and I think the data we obtained with our current study critically validates these efforts. At the same time, I'm trying to demonstrate efficacy of focused ultrasound in improving uh, patient uh, relevant uh, outcomes. Um, the future of the device uh, is uh, moving to become more portable and more patient specific. Uh, I did not go into the details of what the treatment device looks like. However, key efforts are made to um, make the ultrasound delivery more efficient and faster um, and eventually so they can be implemented at every hospital for every patient. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I welcome any questions. Hi everybody, and uh, those were three fantastic presentations. I hope everyone's learning so much and, and starting to formulate their questions. And again, please submit them through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, I previously introduced Dr. Sharnada, who is our radiation oncologist on the panel, and he's now on the call and he's gonna share his screen and start his presentation. So I'm gonna spend the next uh, 10 or 15 
so the impetus for this work uh, deals with uh, tumor vasculature and the fact that it's now recognized that uh, not only focused ultrasound, but radiotherapy can uh, drive tumor responses uh, at the level of the endothelial cells, which are shown here in this artist's representation. It's now uh, recognized that doses of 1.8 to 2 gray of radiotherapy uh, probably uh, cause primarily tumor cell DNA damage, uh, whereas larger doses of 5 to 6 gray uh, drive tumor responses through endothelial cell membrane damage. And there's a particular genetic and enzymatic cascade that is uh, related to that centered around asmase and ceramide. These ultimately lead to mi microvascular disruption and then subsequent tumor cell death. So we postulated a number of years ago that perhaps there could be a synergy between ultrasound stimulated microbubble perturbation of the vasculature uh, and uh, radiotherapy. And so the, for the work that I'm gonna show you today, it's all been conducted using uh, Definity microbubbles. These are Health Canada and FDA approved for imaging uh, and off-label use uh, is what we've uh, been uh, doing. They're about the size of red blood cells shown here in these electron micrographs are uh, some of these Definity bubbles. All the experiments have been done through intravenous injection of the uh, contrast agent and then targeting of uh, tumor both with ultrasound uh, and then subsequently with uh, radiotherapy. So I'm gonna show uh, results from work with mice and then with larger animals, and then some of the uh, more recent results from our uh, ongoing clinical uh, evaluations of this uh, technology. So the first work that we did was now approximately some 10 years ago, published in PNAS, where we took uh, either prostate tumor xenografts or breast cancer xenografts and combined them uh, with uh, various different doses of radiotherapy and then ultrasound and different microbubble uh, concentrations. The pulse duration uh, that we've used is only less than one second uh, spread out over five minutes uh, to allow the blood vessels to refill with bubbles as we're actually insonifying them. The peak negative pressure here is relatively gentle uh, 570 uh, kilopascals. So there probably is some inertial cavitation, but we aren't heating tissue. We aren't uh, destroying tissue as with HIFU. We're uh, just very gently tickling the uh, endothelial cells in the vasculature. So uh, what, what you're actually seeing here are results of the experiment where we've combined zero gray of radiation, two gray of radiation, and eight gray of radiation with uh, a low concentration and a high concentration of bubbles. And it's only in the combined data shown here that you actually see uh, effects of the uh, uh, combination in terms of synergy. You can see you've got large areas in the tumor accounting for 60 to 70% of the tumor volume destroyed within 24 hours after the uh, combined uh, treatments. These results have been borne out now in different tumor types. I've shown you here uh, prostate cancer uh, results. Uh, in the uh, next slide here are results from uh, bladder cancer. And uh, in the next slide here are results from breast cancer. And you can see it's in the combination of the uh, ultrasound and the radiotherapy that you have large amounts of cell death uh, stained here in brown occurring within 24 hours. We know the effect is synergistic uh, in that uh, if you look at uh, the amounts of cell death that are detected 24 hours after the two treatments are given, uh, you have uh, where you treat with radiotherapy alone, very low amounts of cell death. When you treat with bubbles alone, shown here, you have low amounts of cell death. But when you combine the two modalities, uh, you have uh, a uh, amplification of the amount of cell death that occurs. We know the effect is vasculature driven. And uh, what you're looking at here in the top panel only are uh, power Doppler images uh, 24 hours after the experiments have been conducted. This panel here is no therapy, microbubbles and ultrasound alone, radiotherapy alone in this panel, and the combined treatment here. And the areas which are orange are uh, where there's uh, 
detectable blood flow through uh, power Doppler imaging. And you can see here in the combined treatment that there's almost no detectable blood flow that occurs. These effects uh, have been studied both in terms of short-term acute effects shown here, and then long-term animal survival experiments, uh, which we've done in mice as well, where we've combined various forms of therapy. So here in this slide, uh, what you're looking at is uh, experiments uh, from four cohorts. In one cohort, animals received two gray a day for four days uh, a week for a biologically effective dose of 30 gray, which is about a half of a curative dose. We combine that then with ultrasound treatment uh, twice weekly, uh, and then also compare that against just simply ultrasound treatment uh, given twice weekly. The uh, uh, survival uh, results from these experiments uh, indicate that it's only the combined group uh, shown here in the solid line that has significant uh, animal survivability above and beyond what's uh, seen in the other uh, cohorts. So for instance, here in the cohort treated just with bubbles alone, you see that only about 50% uh, of the animals are alive in uh, four weeks time. Uh, and it seems apparent that you need two forms of therapy to maximize survivability. This is also borne out in some of the immunohistochemistry this is uh, KI67 labeling for tumor activity. Uh, and you can see it's only when you have the combined uh, radiotherapy and the bubbles that you have a significant diminishment in uh, actively proliferating tumor cells. So it, what goes on at the vasculature ends up being translated into the uh, inside of the uh, tumor. Uh, and uh, you actually end up in this slide, which is VEGF signaling, uh, you end up, when you combine bubbles and radiotherapy, actually harming the vasculature and then causing uh, proliferation of vas uh, endothelial growth factor for the vasculature. There's a hypoxic effect that uh, uh, occurs. So in this row here is treatment with bubbles, and it's when you combine that with a column and ra radiotherapy, either 2 gray or 8 gray, uh, that you end up with significant amounts of hypoxia or, in fact, anoxia. Uh, and uh, what's going on is the vasculature is probably being destroyed and you're ending up with a complete uh, deoxygenation of the uh, tumor, resulting in those large amounts of cell death which are occurring. We've done experiments in which we have chemically inhibited uh, the one agent ceramide, which uh, is probably linked to this pathway. And it turns out there, uh, so here you're looking at uh, again, zero gray, two gray, and eight gray of radiation. In this row here only are where we've treated with bubbles and ultrasound. You see a cell death occurring here. But if you actually pre-treat the animals with sphingosine 1-phosphate, that agent which inhibits the formation of ceramide, you end up with almost no detectable cell death compared to uh, that uh, experimental cohort there. So we believe we've actually nailed down the bio, uh, the biological uh, agent or, or signaling molecule. We've done other experiments in animals where we've actually given now not over two weeks, but over four weeks and was in twice a week and compared all four cohorts. And again, it's the uh, cohort where you're treating both with ultrasound stimulated bubbles twice weekly and radiotherapy that you end up with significant animal survivability, uh, which is superior uh, to either treatments with radiotherapy alone, bubbles alone, or actually uh, radio, uh, no treatment alone here. Uh, what this work actually uh, indicates is that you actually end up with fibrosis occurring. So here in this top row, we have control animals, animals treated with bubbles alone, radiotherapy alone, and then the combined treatment. And you begin to see uh, increases in the amount of blue staining here in Mason's trichrome, which stains for fibrotic changes. And so probably the, the anoxia that's actually uh, initiated causes subsequent fibrosis. And you can actually see that here in these uh, power Doppler images as well, that it's the combined treatment here in this column uh, week by week in terms of serial imaging where you have 
more and more diminishment of blood flow shown here in the orange in these power Doppler ultrasound images compared to any of the other modalities alone. So I'm just going to skip this slide in the interest of time and then just show you some recent results uh, which we've carried out in larger animals actually in immunocompromised rabbits uh, bearing human prostate and breast cancer lines where we've done similar experiments a shorter period of time because these larger animals are more difficult to work with where again in larger tumors now approximately three to five centimeters in size we've uh, given radiotherapy daily for several weeks ultrasound treatment twice weekly for a total of five treatments and then combine the treatments here for comparison's sake. Again, very similar to the work that was done in mice. Uh, we see that the sur significant survivability uh, in the combined treatment compared to the individual treatments alone. And again, in these tumors, you see a diminishment in blood flow shown here in this power Doppler image uh, only in the combined uh, treatment. And for larger tumors, I'm going to skip this slide, there's even more fibrosis indicated here by this uh, blue uh, staining in Mason's trichrome in the combined therapy compared to either no treatment, treatment with bubbles alone, or radiotherapy alone. So where are we now? We're, we're actually in clinical evaluation uh, using a Philips Sonoleave system that we've reprogrammed to uh, no longer deliver HIFU uh, energies, but uh, low power uh, ultrasound and sonification at about 570 kilopascals again. We have two trials ongoing, uh, one in patients with head and neck cancer and another in patients with chest wall or locally advanced breast cancer. We've now recruited about nine patients to each of these studies. The most typical radiation dose that patients are receiving is five days of radiotherapy and we're combining that with uh, ultrasound stimulated uh, bubble treatments on days one and day five and monitoring patients uh, three months later uh, as well as other times in terms of their uh, outcomes. So I'm just going to show you some representative results from this ongoing work. Uh, this is a breast cancer patient. Uh, you can see here she has a number of uh, lesions in the uh, breast which are coming up through the skin. We ended up focused ultrasound. The whole breast received uh, radiotherapy. And you can see that there's uh, an advanced clear. Dr. Tronada, you're going in and out again. Clearing of the lesions that were actually in the, uh, this is uh, two weeks after the radio that received just radiotherapy. You can see that there's persistent disease, uh, whereas in the treated area, uh, there's uh, a, a better response. Similarly, in the uh, head and neck patients, uh, you can see in this particular patient here, we treated a submandibular area of tumor. And here it is two weeks after the treatment was given with a significant diminishment uh, in the area that was treated. So the goal in the future is to actually begin to implement this on uh, what's a new MRI guided linear accelerator where we're actually working with, with uh, Arrhenius uh, technologies to actually implement their 6,000 element transducer actually onto that radiotherapy platform. So there'll be an all-in-one system that can actually uh, be used. So just to summarize uh, in the last slide here, we believe that the tumor vasculature is uh, important, uh, both in terms of uh, radiotherapy and in terms of the uh, uh, ultrasound stimulated microbubble therapy. Uh, I've not gone into this today, but we've worked out the uh, particular genetic pathway uh, where there's a stimulation of the ceramide pathway initially caused by ultrasound, and that ends up being synergistic with uh, radiotherapy effects. Uh, and uh, we've actually worked out some of the key molecular uh, mechanisms, but it all comes down to uh, stress at the cell membrane, either caused by radiotherapy or uh, focused ultrasound, and then the production of uh, ceramide. So I'll just end by uh, uh, acknowledging a number of people in the uh, laboratory that have uh, done this work. There's been a very large team over the past 10 years of about 40 people 
that have worked on this, and then uh, a number of uh, key granting agencies uh, that have uh, moved this research uh, along. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Shinada. And uh, if you could please turn off your screen share, thank you. And if all the other panelists could now turn on their cameras and unmute themselves, that would be great. Um, I, again, I encourage everyone to submit their questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And Dr. Sharnata, that, that presentation really, um, really was impressive and the work is, is really promising. And uh, I'd like to share with the audience that I am a breast cancer survivor myself and experienced tremendous side effects from radiation therapy, from burns and scarring and fibrosis. So your work is particularly important. I was wondering if you could comment on what role you think focused ultrasound could play? Are you looking to increase the efficacy of radiation therapy, decrease the side effects and lower the dose necessary or both? But I'm, I'm very excited about this moving into clinical trials and, and potentially to help patients. We're interested in uh, potentially doing both. So right now we're focusing on providing patients the standard of care radiotherapy, but enhancing the response. Mm -hmm. But in the future, it may be possible to decrease the overall dose used as we've done in some of the preclinical experiments and obtain the same effect. But right now it's really, it's working very well to enhance the effects of radiation. Uh, albeit we, are, we aren't treating primary breast tumors, we're treating recurrences, but that's often what we start with in terms of clinical trials. Right. And uh, we had a question from the audience for you. Um, do you perform the radiation therapy before or after the microbubbles? So in the trial work, it's after the microbubbles, but interestingly, it doesn't matter which you actually do first. Uh, it works just as well, almost just as well with single treatments with focused ultrasound first as it does with radiation first. Uh, and it turns out that the ideal timing between the two is about six hours. Mm. So it's not immediate. Uh, and we think that has to do with, if you treat with focused ultrasound first, you end up stimulating that genetic pathway and the biological intermediates are probably maximized at six hours. Interesting, interesting. Well, thank you for that. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, panelists, I encourage you uh, to ask any questions or comment. Dr. Sosnata, that was a fantastic presentation and uh, I applaud you understanding how difficult it is to proceed with these clinical trials uh, in the current environment. Um, I did have a, a question I want to ask you. Years ago, I, I participated in a debate, I think at an ISTU meeting, uh, looking at uh, ultrasound guidance versus MR guidance. And I see that the combined device that you guys are thinking of uh, or working on is an MR guided device. And I'm wondering why choose MR rather than ultrasound guidance, which is uh, for my work, I've been using ultrasound guidance uh, entirely, uh, just in terms of ease of use and uh, not needing an entire room to provide the treatment. So I completely agree with you. We ended up with the, we actually uh, ended up with in, with this Philips Sonoleaf system serendipitously. And so we've based our work on that, but certainly from a cost effectiveness point of view and pragmatic point of view, doing this with uh, Ultrasound guidance is probably a more useful way to go. You don't need a room. You could actually potentially deliver these treatments in a in a clinic room or even even in your office if one one wished to. So I actually do think I agree with you. I think that's the superior way to go, both in terms of cost effectiveness, accessibility. Yeah, it's interesting to see that all three of the clinicians here agree with that. I, I we always worry that we're developing a treatment that's really just not gonna be, it's great that we could do it at our, at our home institutions, but so what? You know, in order to really help people, uh, we're gonna need to develop devices and techniques and approaches that are safe and more universally applicable uh, in multiple settings. Because if we don't do that, you know, we're not gonna be able to just treat people at our own institutions. Yeah, I completely, I completely agree with you. The the price point for ultrasound technology is is so affordable now. Uh, things don't cost hundreds of thousands of dollars anymore. You're talking about tens of thousands. So from a healthcare provider and payer point of view, it makes total sense. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Um, Natasha, Dr. Shabani, um, when you talked about reducing the overall myeloid deprived drive stressor cells, does that affect any other functions in the body? Have you noted any other immune effects in the rest of the body? Absolutely. So, you know, from the standpoint of using gemcitabine for this purpose, um, the reality is that gemcitabine does bear impact on other immune cell types as well. This includes um, different T cells, uh, NK cells, B cells, and we have profiled some of these effects in our studies. Um, I see a second part of this question as relating to autoimmune disease, and I do think it's a rather fascinating question. Unfortunately, I can't point to uh, any pieces in the literature that have necessarily addressed this definitively yet. The reality is that we're basically trying to curb mechanisms that are standardly associated with wound healing. And so for patients who may have um, you know, autoimmune diseases in conjunction with cancer, these um, may end up being uh, you know, concerning in the way of the effects that we're trying to exert. But I am curious too to hear, um, you know, Dr. Brennan's opinion, for instance, and whether these types of patients are presenting in the trials or whether this happens to be an exclusion criteria for use of gemcitabine in this case. Um, the short answer is we should do the mouse studies to understand this, but we have not yet. Yeah, so I think one of the, you know, to get at that question, what are the side effects of the gems are? Uh, in these in patients. So the clinical performance of gemcitabine is, is just well established. It's been used uh, for a long time to treat patients. Uh, the dose that we're gonna use in uh, B54 uh, is low enough that it's probably unlikely that patients will experience much hair loss or uh, really much side effects at all from that single dose. Uh, and uh, based on Natasha's work, we hope to be able to knock down um, the myeloid derived suppressor cells adequately with that single dose, as long as the timing is, is right, uh, following uh, for the focused ultrasound ablation. Uh, we just have to see if it's gonna result in a more enduring and uh, vigorous response. Uh, uh, but you know, certainly in mice, it's, it worked, uh, and, uh, but you know, it's a big step uh, moving it to the clinical arena, but uh, we, uh, our study is already IRB approved, FDA approved, we're ready to go. We were just really waiting a little bit uh, uh, on uh, receipt of the new device from Theraclion um, so that we can more reliably visualize these smaller tumors. And Dr. Brennan, uh, just as a follow-up on that, when you're giving the focus ultrasound and the gemcitabine, could the patients also be on other chemotherapies like Taxol or, or other? Um... So, so remember for this study, it's these patients have early stage breast cancer. So this is, you know, this, the treatment is combined with the initial phase of their treatment, which is typically surgery. So they're not receiving chemotherapy at, at that point. So we're not going to be giving neoadjuvant chemotherapy in the classic sense. Technically that single dose of gemcitabine is neoadjuvant treatment, but uh, it's not really given to the typical uh, endpoint of neoadjuvant therapy. Um, and then following enrollment in the trial and treatment in the trial, patients will receive standard of care. So some of them will have uh, some of the agents that you mentioned uh, as part of their treatment, but well after the study, uh, or at least the uh, treatment phase of the study, they'll still be in follow-up, obviously. Uh, well, I'm very encouraged to hear from the panel that we're, we're using focused ultrasound to research various stages of breast cancer. And Dr. Ming, you presented some work with patients who have breast cancer metastases. And um, I was wondering, when you, when you label the Herceptin and you're, you showed us really compelling pictures on how we can increase drug delivery to the brain, um, how many metastases do you think we could really treat at a time with this targeted approach? And is there a size limitation and how long do you follow these patients for? Um, thank you for those questions. Um, so I think we're in the relatively early stages of these clinical trials, we were, um, more careful and then limited in terms of the number of lesions we're treating. But now with the advancement updates, the technology, I think we can treat, um, you know, we've treated five plus lesions. And in terms of volume size, we treat up to a hundred uh, cc or centimeter cube uh, of tissue volume. 
Um, so we're getting faster and more efficient in terms of the treatment. That's what's really dictating um, how much we can treat because um, it's the length of treatment that really uh, is the most challenging part uh, for patients and for us to carry out. Um, and uh, so, so we're getting much better at that. And we haven't really found any tissue toxicity from the actual focus ultrasound blood brain barrier uh, opening um, alone. So that, that in itself does not really limit our treatment, uh, treatment volume. And, and what's been the patient response to undergoing this procedure? Uh, do they find it uh, difficult? Are they uh, expressing that it's fairly easy to use? How, how do they? Yeah, so, so our, our patients are very motivated. Uh, so these early phase clinical trials are very challenging uh, because it's a really new experience for everyone. Um, and But we're learning a lot. And I think uh, with e-treatment, we're getting more patient kind of tailored to the patient and their specific needs. Mm -hmm. uh, so patients have um, had overall positive response to, you know, positive feedback in terms of uh, participating in these studies. Um, and, you know, with the, with the device we're using, which is um, uh, made by Inside Tech, you know, patients don't used to have to shave their hair. Now they, they don't. So uh, that's a really big uh, improvement on patient tolerability of the, uh, of the procedure as well. Great, great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Charnada, we have another question for you. Um, if the microbubbles and focused ultrasound reduces tumor perfusion, wouldn't that be counterproductive to the effects of radiation therapy? So I had just actually typed a response, but okay. uh, it's, actually a, it, it's actually a very good Good question, because it's been long believed that hypoxia actually uh, interferes with uh, radiotherapy. However, here, I think we're dealing with such a profound collapse of tumor vasculature that we're actually, it results in the induction of anoxia. And so if you think of it as a heart attack, but in the middle of a tumor, then it actually makes sense because you're simply starving the tumor of all blood flow and oxygenation. And so that leads to at the end of the day, just like a heart attack leads to myocardial infarction and myocardial tissue death. Here, the same thing happens, but in the middle of a tumor. Okay, thank you for that explanation. And Dr. Brennan, I have this question for you. So we've seen how focused ultrasound can be used with immunotherapies for targeted drug delivery with radiation therapy, but what about surgery? Could focused ultrasound ever replace surgery or um, target the primary lesion to avoid a lumpectomy or mastectomy? And what is your thought on that? Well, I think if you look at the, the progression of treatment of breast cancer over the past uh, many years, there's been a gradual but uh, persistent uh, decrease in the radical nature of its treatment, right? So if thinking back, uh, mod or radical mastectomy, modified radical mastectomy, breast preservation with axillary dissection, breast preservation with sentinel lymph node biopsy, sentinel lymph node biopsy and leaving behind cancer, uh, you know, not doing a completion axillary dissection for patients who have positive nodes. Uh, and what that is clearly telling me, and as uh, uh, Greg can certainly uh, attest to, is uh, all of our treatments together now that we have uh, um, yeah, the real tripartite treatment of patients with breast cancer, radiation, adjuvant systemic therapy, and surgery, it's all been synergistic. And we're able to cut back on the, on the uh, nature, the radical nature of the treatments. We, we've essentially, or we're going to very soon probably abandon axillary surgery on patients who have clinically negative axillas. Uh, so, once we do that, the next step is going to be to do away with surgery itself on selected patients. You know, it's my belief that, that we probably will be able to do that. Uh, we're focused ultrasound and the combination or intersection of focused ultrasound and immune therapy is really gonna come into play is if we can use these two, you know, add that into our, our uh, quiver, if you will, to, to really induce that uh, immune response in the patient to help take care of that primary tumor. So I suspect, you know, at least my opinion that, that you're, what you're 
suggesting is a possibility at some point in the future. Not now. You always have to remember a lumpectomy is a really great operation. You know, most of the time in experienced hands, you know, we have excellent cosmesis uh, and uh, really great clinical outcomes. Uh, that's going to be the bar that we're going to have to achieve, but it's my belief that we might be able to get there using an ablative therapy such as focused ultrasound and combined with radiation therapy, maybe adding an immune therapy uh, therapeutic component to it. So I guess that's my uh, uh, final words on that. Well, um, it's coming close to our time at 12 o'clock and I appreciate everyone for taking time out of their busy day to attend this webinar. And uh, again, just as a closing remark, I think there's so much promise from what you all have told us from the, the preclinical research to the ongoing clinical trials that focused ultrasound really has the potential to uh, help patients with various stages of breast cancer from early stage to late stage and really help, as you said, Dr. Brennan, make this a, a less invasive uh, treatment with less side effects and improved efficacy. So uh, thank you all for your research and your care and taking care of patients with breast cancer. And um, hopefully we can get some follow-up on you and maybe have another webinar soon to, to hear the results of your ongoing clinical trials and research. So thank you all very much. This concludes today's webinar. I wanna thank my IT department, Dr. Palovich and Paige for assisting throughout this event. If your question was not answered or if you'd like more information, please visit our website at fussfoundation.org or email us at info at fussfoundation.org. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, stay tuned to our newsletter and website for invitations to future webinars and online events. And everybody have a great day. Take care. <laughs>